Good Sunday morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. A tentative debt is, date is set for Brett Kavanaugh and the woman accusing him of sexual assault to testify before Senate lawmakers. But will that date hold? President Trump walking back his decision to declassify documents related to the Russia probe as he gets ready to address fellow world leaders at the U.N. General Assembly this week. Good morning. I'm Maria Bartu Romo. Thanks so much for joining us. Welcome to Sunday Morning Futures. Thursday could be the date Judge Brett Kavanaugh and his accuser appear before the Senate Judiciary Committee. But both sides have concerns about the format of the questioning and who would go first. House Judiciary Committee Chairman Bob Goodlatte will be with me coming up. Plus, we will ask Chairman Goodlatte about President Trump's about face, saying he will wait before declassifying key documents involving the Russia investigation and Justice Department officials. We will also talk to another person fighting to see those documents, Judicial Watch President Tom Fitton. And what will the president's message be when the, he addresses the General Assembly at the U.N. this week? We'll get the details in my exclusive interview coming up with National Security Advisor John Bolton, a man who knows the ins and outs of that international body. I will ask Ambassador Bolton about the administration's new offensive to fight cyber attacks as we look ahead right now on Sunday Morning Futures. And kick off with breaking news. Sources are telling Fox News this morning that right now there is a tentative agreement for Supreme Court Justice nominee Judge Brett Kavanaugh and his accuser, Christine Blasey Ford, a California psychology professor, to testify before the Senate Judiciary Committee this upcoming Thursday about her allegation that Kavanaugh sexually assaulted her during a house party when both were teenagers in the early 1980s. Kavanaugh emphatically denies the charge, and recently a fourth person claimed by Ford to have attended the decades-old gathering says she has no recollection of attending the party and does not know Judge Kavanaugh. But the allegation appears to be taking a toll in the realm of public debate. A new Fox News poll just out this morning shows a record number of voters now oppose Kavanaugh's nomination in the wake of Ford's assault allegations, with 50 percent saying that they would not vote to confirm him. That's up from 46 percent last month, as more people now believe Ford over Kavanaugh. Still, there are others, including many Republicans, that are asking about Judge Kavanaugh's right to due process and the last-minute timing of this accusation in such a politically charged environment. We have House Judiciary Committee Chairman and Virginia Republican Congressman Bob Goodlatte standing by this morning, and we will speak with him in moments. But first, let's quickly get to the latest on where we stand with all of this. Fox News Capitol Hill senior producer Chad Pergram, who joins me right now on the telephone with the latest. Chad, good morning. What can you tell us? Good morning. The question is whether this prospective plan to hear from Christine Blasey Ford at 10 a.m. on Thursday crumbles. Everything so far has been so tenuous and so fluid, it's hard to tell if something's going to change. Now, if this does fall apart today, Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Chuck Grassley is poised to have a committee vote on Brett Kavanaugh 24 hours from right now and advance the nomination to the Senate floor. But the big unknown is whether Republicans on the committee or even other GOP senators could balk telling Grassley he can't have a vote because they lack information about the allegations. That's the wild card. If they do move ahead running through all of the Senate procedural traps by the books, it would take until about Friday night at the earliest for a confirmation vote on the floor. But still, this nomination might be in peril. The Senate is divided. 51 Republicans, 49 Democrats. The Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, he's a very good vote counter. If any Republican senator jumps ship or tells McConnell to tap the brakes, this nomination may lack the votes on the floor. The Senate math is paramount, Maria. All right. We are watching this and whether or not they have the votes. So we're still waiting to see if Thursday takes place then, uh, Chad. Absolutely. And, and again, you don't have to have a successful vote out of the committee to move something to the Senate floor. Robert Bork when he was confirmed, he got no recommendation from the committee. And even though uh, I should say Clarence Thomas, Clarence Thomas, in the case of Robert Bork, though, he got a, a negative recommendation from the committee. Why is a committee vote even necessary? Well, you have a lot of senators who don't sit on the Judiciary Committee, and they need to have advice from their fellow senators on this type of nomination or any nomination. Mm. But again, I go back to that math. That math on the floor is going to be critical. There was a nomination earlier this year which was uh, torpedoed at the last moment. Right. Uh, a nominee for the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals who they pulled off the floor because they realized at the last moment they didn't have Chad, thank you. Chad Pergram joining us there in Washington. Let's now bring in House Judiciary Committee Chairman, Virginia Republican Congressman Bob Goodlatte. Mr. Chairman, thanks very much for joining us this morning. 
Maria, it's great to be with you. What can you tell us about this process and what's going on? Uh, how do you see things? Well, I think that uh, Chairman Grassley has bent over backwards to make sure that these uh, very serious allegations uh, give the uh, woman making the charges, Ms. Ford, an opportunity uh, to come and testify. In fact, he's offered her about four different ways to go about doing that. Uh, I think if she is serious about these charges, uh, she needs to come and testify. So I'm glad there's at least a tentative agreement. Uh, but we can't have a situation where uh, very legitimate nominees for very important government positions have charges uh, placed against them at the very last minute uh, and then they're used as a delaying tactic to try to uh, derail the nomination. That is simply inappropriate. The Democrats on the committee are clearly doing that. Uh, so I think he's handled it well, but I think he's also right to say uh, either come and testify at the time appointed or uh, we need to go ahead with our vote. But Mr. Chairman, isn't that exactly what you're faced with, frankly? I mean, that's what's going on. I mean, if, she, if, if Ms. Ford continues to come up with new demands and pushing it back and pushing it back, then, then they're victorious. Then they are delaying the vote as much as possible and, and trying hard to kill it. Well, that's, there are a great many people who think that's exactly what's going on. Uh, but again, uh, these are serious allegations, and Judge Kavanaugh has been vehement in his uh, denial uh, of the charges. So they both need to have the opportunity uh, to speak their piece on the issue. And if she's not going to press the, the allegation uh, with her own testimony, then I think they have to go ahead with the vote. Do, do you feel that there will be the do you have the votes in the senate well i believe that uh, the votes are there <clears throat> but i also think uh... it's very important that uh... everyone who votes on this feels like there has been a fair process offered so that these last minute charges uh... can be properly aired uh... and let me also say this most recent demand by uh, her attorneys that uh, Judge Kavanaugh go, goes first uh, just defies all uh, important precedent in matters like this. Uh, she has not testified. We have not even seen, uh, to my knowledge, uh, the letter that she sent to Senator Feinstein that Senator Feinstein sat on uh, for two months. But uh, now he's expected to come forward and deny allegations that she hasn't even made uh, in any formal fashion uh, at this point. I think that's entirely inappropriate. She needs to come forward, she needs to offer her testimony, and then he needs to have the opportunity to testify and tell uh, what he knows, if anything, about this whole incident, other than his uh, clear and outright denial that it ever took place. Well, you're, well, you're right. I mean, I, the last time I checked, that, that's the way America works. You are uh, innocent until, until proven guilty, and she's making the accusations. It, it, would, it, it seems weird to have him go first if she She's the one making the charges, uh, but, but we'll see where that goes. If she does not testify on Thursday, do you believe the Senate will hold the vote? Uh, I think they should go forward with the vote. I think that would be a very clear indication uh, that uh, the only thing on the table is an outstanding record uh, on the part of a very experienced judge, perhaps one of the most qualified nominees ever for the United States mm. Supreme Court, uh, and this last-minute charge, uh, not even pressed by the person uh, alleging it, uh, would, I think, call for a vote and a confirmation of Judge Kavanaugh. All right, Mr. Chairman, let me move on to another incredibly explosive story, and that is, of course, about Rod Rosenstein, uh, the attorney, uh, the deputy attorney general. I, I, my question here is, I, I don't understand how Rod Rosenstein could convene a meeting with other Justice Department officials and the president, um, convince the president to walk back declassifying documents, um, and then we learned that he was willing to wear a wire and invoke the 25th Amendment uh, to, to take down President Trump. He also, we know, uh, okayed the final FISA warrant, which we know was based on unverified information. How is Rod Rosenstein leading and able to do this? How is the president even listening to him post all of this? 
Well, I can't answer for the president, but I can say this, that I have told the president uh, that I think it is very, very important that the American people get access to the information that underlies all of this. So, several things. First of all, the president should move forward expeditiously. We do have to make sure that uh, sources and methods uh, uh, for uh, classified information are not revealed, but that can be done, and it can be done expeditiously, particularly with regard to this information, where an awful lot of it is already out uh, in the news media. But key, key points uh, that uh, we do not have uh, the clear uh, final uh, input on are in documents that we need to have declassified. So the president should continue to press for that and should press for it to be done as quickly as possible. Secondly, uh, we have been very, very concerned about the lack of production of some documents. We've gotten a lot of documents, access to more than a million documents from the Department of Justice from, but some key, key documents, including the so-called McCabe memos, which could very directly bear upon this question of uh, what was Rod Rosenstein doing in that meeting uh, immediately prior to the appointment of Robert Mueller as the special counsel, uh, and are these allegations that are in the New York Times actually true? Uh, I think that can be, uh, a lot of light can be shed on that if the documents we've been requesting for quite some time are made public. So as a result of that, this week, uh, if they're not produced by tomorrow or Tuesday, this week, uh, we are going to issue a subpoena uh, to the Justice Department that expands upon the subpoena we issued earlier this year and includes the McCabe memos uh, and some other documents that have been requested by us but thus far not produced, including Peter Strzok's personnel file, some of the Strzok page uh, texts, uh, the, uh, um, the, the Bruce Orr 301 and some other things. Now, some of these may be declassified uh, in this process with the president, but whether they are or not, the Congress is entitled to see them unredacted, and they're entitled to see them right now. And it's especially important now that this new crisis of confidence has arisen uh, in the conduct of uh, Mr. Rosenstein, but uh, most importantly, because we want to get to the bottom of how this investigation uh, was ever launched in the first place, way back uh, in the first first half of 2016 during the presidential election. Right, and, and we know that it wasn't based on any official intelligence. We've gone through this for the last year we, between you, uh, your colleagues in Congress, Devin Nunes, John Ratcliffe, Trey Gowdy. We know that it was based on nothing. But I, I guess my, my question here is, in terms of next week and the potential subpoena, with all due respect, sir, you've been asking for lots of documents for a long time. Do you have any confidence that you're actually going to get the McCabe memos out or these documents that you want? Are you willing to go all the way if, in fact, you subpoena those documents and you still don't get them? What? what how is there accountability? Yes, we are going... We are going to persist in this, and we have obtained a very substantial amount of information. Our understanding of what was going on in 2016 and into 2017 is greatly enhanced because of compliance by the Department of Justice and the FBI uh, with our earlier subpoena. There are still uh, issues outstanding, and uh, this uh, relatively new request with regard to the McCabe memos uh, must be resolved, Bye. but I have every confidence that it will occur because uh, I know, for example, that the President of the United States States wants the American people to know what was going right. on uh, and also to see the contrast between how the FBI bent over backwards uh, to uh, afford uh, every opportunity to not prosecute Hillary Clinton right. and at the same time in the same manner uh, leaned in, in in ways that are inexplicable other than uh, for political motivation yeah. to launch an investigation without having any any meaningful evidence uh, that there was a basis for launching the investigation in the so-called Trump-Russia collusion, which it's, now more than two years later, we still see no evidence of such a thing. It's quite extraordinary, and I have to say, I, I didn't believe it from the moment it started. Um, the president tweeted this yesterday. He says, I met with the DOJ concerning the declassification of various unredacted documents. They agreed to release them, but stated that so doing may have perceived negative impact on the Russia probe. Also, also, key allies called to ask not to release. Therefore, the inspector general has been asked to review these documents on an expedited basis. I believe he will move quickly on this and hopefully other things which he is looking at. In the end, I can always declassify 
if it proves necessary. Speed is very important to me and everyone. Mr. Chairman, I got to get your reaction to this with the midterm elections less than 50 days away. Stay with us. A lot more from you when we come right back. Welcome back, and I'm back with House Judiciary Committee Chairman Bob Goodlatte. And Mr. Chairman, in the president's tweet yesterday, he said speed is important to everyone. When would you expect the American people to get a sense of what is in those FISA documents that the president initially said he would declassify? Well, the president needs to remain hands-on on this issue. He needs to be personally engaged in overseeing the process by which those documents are declassified. I'm glad he has uh, entrusted the Inspector General at the Department of Justice to help with this because I have great uh, confidence in the Inspector General, but he needs to be in constant contact with the president uh, and the White House staff about accomplishing this and accomplishing it very quickly uh, in, in a matter of days, not weeks. Uh, to get these documents released uh, in a form that protects sources and methods but lets the American people see what has been going on. It's Transparency uh, should be at the heart of this. That's where the president's heart is uh, and that is, in my opinion, what needs to happen here so everyone can judge for themselves I mean, is it possible, uh, what was going on. Is it possible that Rod Rosenstein is overseeing the Robert Mueller investigation and yet Rosenstein uh, was the one who okayed the fourth uh, uh, FISA warrant? H how is that possible? And then now we know about this other report well, we that he wore, wanted to wear a wire and, and invoke the 25th. Uh well, that's why I think it's so important that these documents get out because, uh, in my opinion, uh, and I'm not going to point uh, fingers at any particular individual, we know there's a lot of yeah. tension uh, between people like James Comey and John McCabe uh, and, uh, and Rod Rosenstein, but we need to have the facts out uh, so that we can uh, decide for ourselves. And I will repeat again what I have said uh, for many months now, and that is that the Attorney General of the United States needs to appoint a special counsel to look into all of this because uh, there are potential conflicts there, but it's hard to conclude what those conflicts are when not all the documents are out there uh, and we have conflicting uh, reports in various right. sources of the news media. Just like with the Kavanaugh uh, and Ford matter, we should not be trying this in the media. We should be uh, letting the United States Senate uh, follow their process and make a decision there. Right. And here, the House of Representatives, uh, the People's House, needs to have access to these documents so that then the American people can learn what has transpired right. uh, Chairman, in what I think is a major uh, miscarriage of justice in these two investigations, yes. two incredibly important investigations uh, I just want to ask you begun real quick, in 2016. Before you, before you go, Mr. Chairman, I just want to reiterate the breaking news that you just gave us, and that is if you don't get the documents, including the McCabe memos, you will subpoena them next week. And number two, Nellie Orr, is she refusing to testify? Uh, uh, no, M Mel uh, Nellie Orr is cooperating. Uh, we have a, a date for her appearance before uh, the committee for an interview on October 19th. Uh, however, I think that, that uh, your first point, okay. I want to reemphasize, it's not next week we'll issue the subpoena, it's this week that this we'll week. issue the subpoena this upcoming week. Uh, if those documents are not immediately forthcoming. Mr. Chairman, thank you. We'll be right back. View of foreign policy. For a preview of what we could expect in this exclusive interview right now, National Security Advisor John Bolton. Ambassador, great to see you this morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Glad to be back. What should we expect from the president this week? Well, I think he's got a couple major uh, possibilities really to help illuminate for the American people what America's place in the world is. His General Assembly speech on Tuesday that you mentioned will talk a lot about American sovereignty, how that fits into America's place in the world as a whole. Uh, in addition, there's a Security Council meeting on Wednesday where he'll talk about his non-proliferation policies dealing with the nuclear threats of North Korea and Iran. Very important to show uh, how different uh, his handling of those is because of the different circumstances. Uh, and we've got uh, major issues with two of the world's other uh, powers, China on trade and on broader issues of geostrategic conflict, uh, and Russia, uh, where we're confronting in a number of different areas. So I think the president will have a chance to show how full the international agenda is uh, and how active he has been in each of these different areas. Has China pushed back in any way since the president started pushing 
poking and poking China the way he has because we know that China has been stealing intellectual property for decades and they won't admit it. Have they changed their behavior in any way? Well, I think they're still trying to figure out what the president's up to, although there's no doubt in some of the tariffs that they've imposed, they've targeted uh, the president's supporters in Congress to see if they can change the majority. Uh, I think a lot of people don't understand exactly what's at stake here, and I think the president will address this. This is not just an economic issue. This is not just talking about tariffs and the terms of trade. This is a question of power. The intellectual property theft that you mentioned has a, has a major impact on uh, China's economic capacity and therefore on its military capacity. And I think the president correctly understands that when China gets economic power by stealing from the United States and others, it's time to call a stop to it. And then they are applying that economic power uh toward their military complex by creating these islands in the in the South China Sea and dominating them and then setting up setting up military bases there is that right right exactly China you know they talk in the Middle East about creating facts on the ground in the uh, Israel Palestinian issue China is creating the ground in the South China Sea and putting more facts on top of it it's very dangerous very aggressive uh, something that uh, that the administration has confronted and I think all of this goes to what will be the major theme of the 21st century which is how how China and the United States get along. Yeah. Take us behind the scenes in that room in the UN General Assembly because you've got players like Syria, Russia, and there have been developments there in the news. What is most important that the American people need to focus on as we watch all of these players interact this upcoming week? Well, I think it shows how complex the international environment is. Let, let's take the case of Syria, where just in the past few days, uh, the Syrians shot down a Russian airplane, killing 15 Russians. Uh, their allies, uh, Syria and Russia. Russia has two bases, military bases in Syria. This happened because of an Israeli airstrike against Iranians who were trying to equip uh, the Hezbollah terrorists with ballistic missile capabilities. So here's something that shows the continuing threat of Iran, not just on the nuclear side, but in aggressive militaristic behavior in the region that puts us at risk of this kind of conflict. What, what happens next with Iran? I mean, how do you see that relationship changing? Well, the president's decision to withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal has had a profound effect on Iran and the region as a whole. And with even stronger sanctions coming back uh, in November, uh, we think we've disrupted their uh, efforts to impose their will in countries around the region. Uh, we think these new sanctions coming in will have a significant uh, economic and political effect inside the country. And that's what we want. We want massive changes in behavior by the regime in Iran. And if they don't uh, undertake that, they'll face more consequences because we'll find more sanctions to impose and other ways to put maximum pressure on them. So more consequences for Iran, you think, th then we will see further sanctions if they do not comply. Absolutely, no doubt about what it. What about Syria? Will there be a response in terms of the U.S. and Syria? Well, you know, the president was very clear. He expects that, uh, that Syria is not going to engage in a, in a brutal invasion of Idlib province. Uh, we've commented that if Syria uses chemical weapons again in Idlib or anywhere else, uh, they will face a third response militarily from the United States, and it will not be small because we want to make it clear that we expect this is never going to happen again. So the Mil Mil Middle East remains extremely volatile. Our friend uh, Israel is in danger from Iran. Our friends in the oil-producing monarchies of the Arabian Peninsula are at risk from Iran. Uh, and this, the kind of uh, economic and political instability that Iran is causing in that region and, and around the world is unacceptable. And then there's the Qataris who, of course, are uh, friendly or partners with the Muslim Brotherhood. Yeah, we've made it very clear. We think all this support for terrorism should stop. You know, the president's first overseas trip was in Riyadh, where he created the anti-terror coalition. All the countries that attended, including Gutter, promised to give up their support for terrorism. Uh, the Qataris need to make that uh, need to make that come true. As national security advisor, I wonder your thoughts on this whole. Uh, cabal in the intelligence community and what we're dealing with in terms of the investigation into Trump-Russia collusion that is non-existent uh, yeah. two years later. Well, you know, the president uh, gets criticized for being soft on Russia. I'm, I'm still waiting to see evidence of that. You know, he has authorized
authorized us to take uh, very strong action against election meddling by anybody, uh, strong action against intrusions into our information technology systems by countries like Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. Uh, just uh, last week, he signed a, a new directive that reverses the Obama administration policy of uh, not encouraging offensive cyber operations by the United States. This is a major change yeah. uh, in the way we're doing business, and uh, our adversaries need to know that. This is what I want to talk to you about. Let's take a short break. I want to hear more about this new policy on cyber, because it is a reversal from President Obama's policy. More of my exclusive interview coming up with National Security Advisor John Bolton. Just days ago, Ambassador Bolton outlined the Trump administration's new policy to go on the offensive with those cyber attacks. We're looking ahead on Sunday Morning Futures. Stay with us. View of foreign policy. For a preview of what we could expect in this exclusive interview right now, National Security Advisor John Bolton. Ambassador, great to see you this morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Glad to be back. What should we expect from the president this week? Well, I think he's got a couple major uh, possibilities really to help illuminate for the American people what America's place in the world is. His General Assembly speech on Tuesday that you mentioned will talk a lot about American sovereignty, how that fits into America's place in the world as a whole. Uh, in addition, there's a Security Council meeting on Wednesday where he'll talk about his non-proliferation policies dealing with the nuclear threats of North Korea and Iran. Very important to show uh, how different uh, his handling of those is because of the different circumstances. Uh, and we've got uh, major issues with two of the world's other uh, powers, China on trade and on broader issues of geostrategic conflict uh, and Russia, uh, where we're confronting in a number of different areas. So I think the president will have a chance to show how full the international agenda is uh, and how active he has been in each of these different areas. Has China pushed back in any way since the president started pushing and poking China the way he has because we know that China has been stealing intellectual property for decades and they won't admit it. Have they changed their behavior in any way? Well, I think they're still trying to figure out what the president's up to, although there's no doubt in some of the tariffs that they've imposed, they've targeted uh, the president's supporters in Congress to see if they can change the majority. Uh, I think a lot of people don't understand exactly what's at stake here, and I think the president will address this. This is not just an economic issue. This is not just talking about tariffs and the terms of trade. This is a question of power. The intellectual property theft that you mentioned has a, has a major impact on uh, China's economic capacity and therefore on its military capacity. And I think the president correctly understands that when China gets economic power by stealing from the United States and others, it's time to call a stop to it. And then they are applying that economic power uh, toward their military complex by creating these islands in the in the South China Sea and dominating them and then sitting up setting up military bases there is that right right exactly China you know they talk in the Middle East about creating facts on the ground in the uh, Israel Palestinian issue China is creating the ground in the South China Sea and putting more facts on top of it it's very dangerous very aggressive uh, something that uh, that the administration has confronted and I think all of this goes to what will be the major theme of the 21st century which is how China and the United States get along. Yeah. Take us behind the scenes in that room in the UN General Assembly because you've got players like Syria, Russia, and there have been developments there in the news. What is most important that the American people need to focus on as we watch all of these players interact this upcoming week? Well, I think it shows how complex the international environment is. Let, let's take the case of Syria, where just in the past few days, uh, the Syrians shot down a Russian airplane, killing 15 Russians. Uh, their allies, uh, Syria and Russia. Russia has two bases, military bases in Syria. This happened because of an Israeli airstrike against Iranians who were trying to equip uh, the Hezbollah terrorist with ballistic missile capabilities. So here's something that shows the continuing threat of Iran, not just on the nuclear side, but in aggressive militaristic behavior in the region that puts us at risk of this kind of conflict. What, what happens next with Iran? I mean, how do you see that relationship changing? Well, the president's decision to withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal has had a profound effect on Iran and the region as a whole. And with even stronger sanctions coming back uh, in November, uh, we think we've disrupted their uh, efforts to impose their will in countries around the region. Uh, we think these new sanctions coming in will have a significant uh, economic and political effect inside the country. And that's what we want. We want massive changes in behavior by the regime in Iran. And if they don't 
uh, undertake that, they'll face more consequences because we'll find more sanctions to impose and other ways to put maximum pressure on them. So more consequences for Iran, you think, th then we will see further sanctions if they do not comply. Absolutely, no doubt about what it. What about Syria? Will there be a response in terms of the U.S. and Syria? Well, you know, the president was very clear. He expects that, uh, that Syria is not going to engage in a, in a brutal invasion of Idlib province. Uh, we've commented that if Syria uses chemical weapons again in Idlib or anywhere else, uh, they will face a third response militarily from the United States, and it will not be small because we want to make it clear that we expect this is never going to happen again. So the Mil Mil Middle East remains extremely volatile. Our friend uh, Israel is in danger from Iran. Our friends in the oil-producing monarchies of the Arabian Peninsula are at risk from Iran. Uh, and this, the kind of uh, economic and political instability that Iran is causing in that region and, and around the world is unacceptable. And then there's the Qataris who, of course, are uh, friendly or partners with the Muslim Brotherhood. Yeah, we've made it very clear. We think all this support for terrorism should stop. You know, the president's first overseas trip was in Riyadh, where he created the anti-terror coalition. All the countries that attended, including Gutter, promised to give up their support for terrorism. Uh, the Qataris need to make that uh, need to make that come true. As national security advisor, I wonder your thoughts on this whole uh, cabal in the intelligence community and what we're dealing with in terms of the investigation into Trump Russia collusion that is non-existent uh, two years later. Well, you know, the president uh, gets criticized for being soft on Russia. I'm, I'm still waiting to see evidence of that. You know, he has authorized us to take uh, very strong action against election meddling by anybody, uh, strong action against intrusions into our information technology systems by countries like Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. Uh, just uh, last week, he signed a, a new directive that reverses the Obama administration policy of uh, not encouraging offensive cyber operations by the United States. States. This is a major change yeah. uh, in the way we're doing business, and uh, our adversaries need to know that. This is what I want to talk to you about. Let's take a short break. I want to hear more about this new policy on cyber, because it is a reversal from President Obama's policy. More of my exclusive interview coming up with National Security Advisor John Bolton. Just days ago, Ambassador Bolton outlined the Trump administration's new policy to go on the offensive with those cyber attacks. We're looking ahead on Sunday Morning Future. Stay with us. of foreign policy. For a preview of what we could expect in this exclusive interview right now, National Security Advisor John Bolton. Ambassador, great to see you this morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Glad to be back. What should we expect from the president this week? Well, I think he's got a couple major uh, possibilities really to help illuminate for the American people what America's place in the world is. His General Assembly speech on Tuesday that you mentioned will talk a lot about American sovereignty, how that fits into America's place in the world as a whole. Uh, in addition, there's a Security Council meeting on Wednesday where he'll talk about his non-proliferation policies dealing with the nuclear threats of North Korea and Iran. Very important to show uh, how different uh, his handling of those is because of the different circumstances. Uh, and we've got uh, major issues with two of the world's other uh, powers, China on trade and on broader issues of geostrategic conflict, uh, and Russia, uh, where we're confronting in a number of different areas. So I think the president will have a chance to show how full the international agenda is uh, and how active he has been in each of these different areas. Has China pushed back in any way since the president started pushing and poking China the way he has because we know that China has been stealing intellectual property for decades and they won't admit it? Have they changed their behavior in any way? Well, well, I think they're still trying to figure out what the president's up to, although there's no doubt in some of the tariffs that they've imposed, they've targeted uh, the president's supporters in Congress to see if they can change the majority. Uh, I think a lot of people don't understand exactly what's at stake here, and I think the president will address this. This is not just an economic issue. This is not just talking about tariffs in the terms of trade. This is a question of power. The intellectual property theft that you mentioned has a, has a major impact on uh, China's economic capacity and therefore on its military capacity. And I think the president correctly understands that when China gets economic power by stealing from the United States and others, it's time to call a stop to it. And then they are applying that economic power uh, 
toward their military complex by creating these islands in the in the South China Sea and dominating them and then setting up setting up military bases there. Is that right? Right, exactly. China, you know, they talk in the Middle East about creating facts on the ground in the uh, Israel-Palestinian issue. China is creating the ground in the South China Sea and putting more facts on top of it. It's very dangerous, very aggressive, uh, something that, uh, that the administration has confronted. And I think all of this goes to what will be the major theme of the 21st century, which is how China and the United States get along. Yeah. Take us behind the scenes in that room in the UN General Assembly, because you've got players like Syria, Russia, and there have been developments there in the news. What is most important that the American people need to focus on as we watch all of these players interact this upcoming week? Well, I think it shows how complex the international environment is. Let, let's take the case of Syria, where just in the past few days, uh, the Syrians shot down a Russian airplane, killing 15 Russians. Uh, their allies, uh, Syria and Russia, Russia has two bases, military bases in Syria. This happened because of an Israeli airstrike against Iranians who are trying to equip uh, the Hezbollah terrorists with ballistic missile capabilities. So here's something that shows the continuing threat of Iran, not just on the nuclear side, but in aggressive militaristic behavior in the region that puts us at risk of this kind of conflict. What, what happens next with Iran? I mean, how do you see that relationship changing? Well, the president's decision to withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal has had a profound effect on Iran and the region as a whole. And with even stronger sanctions coming back uh, in November, uh, we think we've disrupted their uh, efforts to impose their will in countries around the region. Uh, we think these new sanctions coming in will have a significant uh, economic and political effect inside the country. And that's what we want. We want massive changes in behavior by the regime in Iran. And if they don't uh, undertake that, they'll face more consequences because we'll find more sanctions to impose and other ways to put maximum pressure on them. So more consequences for Iran, you think, th then we will see further sanctions if they do not comply. Absolutely, no doubt about what it. What about Syria? Will there be a response in terms of the U.S. and Syria? Well, you know, the president was very clear. He expects that, uh, that Syria is not going to engage in a, in a brutal invasion of Idlib province. Uh, we've commented that if Syria uses chemical weapons again in Idlib or anywhere else, uh, they will face a third response militarily from the United States, and it will not be small because we want to make it clear that we expect this is never going to happen again. So the Mil Mil Middle East remains extremely volatile. Our friend uh, Israel is in danger from Iran. Our friends in the oil-producing monarchies of the Arabian Peninsula are at risk from Iran. Uh, and this, the kind of uh, economic and political instability that Iran is causing in that region and, and around the world is unacceptable. And then there's the Qataris, who of course are uh, friendly or partners with the Muslim Brotherhood. Yeah, we've made it very clear. We think all this support for terrorism should stop. You know, the president's first overseas trip was in Riyadh, where he created the anti-terror coalition. All the countries that attended, including Qatar, promised to give up their support for terrorism. Uh, the Qataris need to make that uh, need to make that come true. As national security advisor, I wonder your thoughts on this whole uh, cabal in the intelligence community and what we're dealing with in terms of the investigation into Trump Russia collusion that is non-existent uh, yeah. two years later. Well, you know, the president uh, gets criticized for being soft on Russia. I'm, I'm still waiting to see evidence of that. You know, he has authorized us to take uh, very strong action against election meddling by anybody, uh, strong action against intrusions into our information technology systems by countries like Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. Uh, just uh, last week, he signed a, a new directive that reverses the Obama administration policy of uh, not not encouraging offensive cyber operations by the United States. This is a major change yeah. uh, in the way we're doing business, and uh, our adversaries need to know that. This is what I want to talk to you about. Let's take a short break. I want to hear more about this new policy on cyber, because it is a reversal from President Obama's policy. More of my exclusive interview coming up with National Security Advisor John Bolton. Just days ago, Ambassador Bolton outlined the Trump administration's new policy to go on the offensive with those cyber attacks. We're looking ahead on Sunday Morning Future. Stay with us.